Thank you, Dr. Alka. Come, I'll just make a comment. Because we're we are running, running short, short of time, time I, I will... will. Thank you very much. And can you hear me? Thank you very much, and uh, thank you to Nita and the organizers for the invitation. I've not been to Pune for over 30 years because my sister studied here in Mount Carmel, Mount Carmel School in Pune uh, many years ago. So we used to visit every month, and then when she left Pune, uh, it sort of went off our radar. So thank you very much for the invitation. I've been asked to speak about uh, adaptive food guidelines, uh, and the title is, Are We Winning the War? on complications with preventions. So that's my uh, disclosures. So let's talk about guidelines. Why is it important that we need guidelines? So guidelines is the statement by which to determine a course of action. And guidelines help us in making the right decisions when we manage patients with diabetes or with diabetic foot. It also helps streamline particular processes according to a set routine or sound practice. But actually, guidelines are statements that include recommendations to optimize patient care, informed by a systematic review of evidence, and an assessment of the benefits and harms of alternate care options. And guidelines are put forth by experts within the field to look at all the evidence um, and then come up with the guidelines so that we can give our patients the best possible care. So guidelines will help improve the effectiveness and the quality of care, but importantly, it will decrease variations in clinical practice. It would also help decrease costly preventable mistakes and adverse events. So guidelines help in, in a sort of a multifaceted way in looking after uh, patients with, with diabetic foot. So the earliest medical guidelines that we know of is around 4,000 years old, and this is the uh, papyrus from Egypt where they actually looked at facial trauma and it's called the Edwin Smith papyrus. But the guidelines that we are more familiar with is the Hippocratic Oath guidelines and this probably is the first guidelines that we know about. So this is a guideline, an, uh, an oath that we take uh, when we qualify as doctors. So all of us know about it. Most of us apply it in some way or another but few of us actually remember it in our daily clinical practice. So what we therefore need are guidelines that are succinct, precise, but also easy to remember. So before we go down the guideline route, let's look a little bit about the epidemiology of the diabetic foot. So the diabetic foot is increasing, and diabetes is increasing, and so are problems in the foot. It is the most serious and costly complication of diabetes. We also see increasing morbidity because of foot ulceration, amputations, and impaired quality of life, but also increased mortality. I think, therefore, we need to work together on the war footing so that we can reduce complications of diabetes, but also to reduce ulcerations and reduce the amputations we see in our patients with diabetes. This is data taken from a few years ago. The IDF reported that in 2015, there were 5 million deaths for people with diabetes. This was more than the combined deaths caused by some of the important infectious diseases globally, combining HIV, tuberculosis, and malaria. And what we expect to see over the next 15, 20 years is an increasing number of people with diabetes globally, predicted by about 642 million by 2040. In 2019, we had 4.2 million deaths in people with diabetes, and we know that 25% of all people with diabetes can develop a foot ulcer in their lifetime. So you can imagine the enormity of the problem you're going to face over the next 15 years. 
And of course, then we had the COVID pandemic. And we know during the COVID pandemic, there was increasing people uh, with diabetes, mortality was higher in people with diabetes, but there's also been reported uh, outcomes for poor foot care and amputations in, uh, in various parts of the world. So with COVID, we saw 6.4 million deaths over the last three years. That is equivalent to the deaths we see per year for people with diabetes. But you know the amount of money that was spent by governments to treat and prevent COVID-19 and, and, and the fatality we were seeing, but that money is not being spent to treat people with diabetic foot problems. So we need to see a paradigm shift in the way governments fund diabetes and its complications. Because treating diabetes and diabetic foot is very expensive. Data from the US, treating a foot ulcer costs $44,000. And in the UK, we spend $10 billion every year to treat diabetes. Half, almost half of that money is spent treating people with, with, uh, with, with wounds and diabetic foot wounds. This is looking at data now from the Eurodial study. You may have heard of the study that, that we were also involved with. It was a study done uh, across uh, 10 countries, 15 centers in Europe. And patients who had a new foot ulcer being referred to the multidisciplinary foot team were included in the study. We divided these 1,200 patients uh, with foot ulcers in if they had just a neuropathic ulcer, uh, without infection or a neuropathic ulcer with infection, uh, people with PAD and PAD and infection. And you can see that patients who had purely neuropathic non-infected ulcer to treat the wound, it cost around 4,000 euros. If the ulcer got infected, the price doubled to around 9,000 euros. But if you added in PAD, it went up to 16 to 7,000 euros. So treating a diabetic foot ulcer is very, very expensive. And in the US, when they looked at cost of limb, uh, adaptive limb complications, in that particular year, about seven years ago, it cost us 17, uh, 17 uh, billion dollars, more expensive than treating some of the common malignancies, such as breast malignancy, colorectal cancer, et cetera. Again, similar to the COVID-19 pandemic, we spent so much of money to treat and prevent cancers, but that money is not being spent on preventing diabetic foot complications. What about mortality? This slide here shows the five-year mortality for some of the common cancers and people with diabetic foot problems. You can see people with neuropathic ulcers and uh, those who have previous amputations or ischemic ulcers, the five-year mortality was much higher than some of the common cancers such as breast cancer and Hodgkin disease and the mortality was similar to patients with colon cancer. So again, I, ask, I say the same question again, why aren't we spending the same amount of money to treat and prevent diabetic foot problems? So what about the variations in care on how we deliver diabetic foot care? Again, data from the, uh, from the IDF, the prevalence of foot ulceration in Western Europe is around 1%. So 1% of all people with diabetes will have a foot ulcer. But in Africa, it is 11%, so 10 times higher. But if you look at some of the areas in the Caribbean, it is almost 20 times higher. So why this huge variation in care? It may be financial, it may be a lack of access to, to health care, but this is something that we need to tackle so we can reduce amputations globally, not only in some of the developed and well-developed countries. What about within country variation? This is data taken from the UK. Um, in England, we have the National Diabetic Food Care Audit. This has been uh, going on for the last uh, eight to 10 years. And this is data from 2017. And this is looking at amputations at CCG level. CCG stands for Clinical Communist Groups um, in the UK. You can see to the left of the graph, um, the amputation rates, uh, this is for 10,000 people with diabetes, was just over 20. And to the right of the graph, it is around two to five per 10,000. So even after adjusting for age and ethnicity, there was an eight-fold variation in lower limb amputations across England. Similarly also, it was found in the US, and you can see again in the US, the difference in amputations here in the south is much higher 
if you look at areas up in the north and the northwest of the US. But what they noticed is that there was clustering of better and worse care. So if in a particular part of the US care was worse, around that region also the care was not so good. And if you had a region where the care was quite good, around that region the care was much better. So there's clustering of poor care or better. And we need to learn from these areas and why the care is better and why in other areas the care is not so good. What about the etiology of diaptic foot ulcers? This is data from the UK, um, and then this is the study from the Eurodial. You can see the prevalence or, or the underlying uh, predisposing factor for somebody to get a foot ulcer was mainly in neuropathy many years ago. And then over time, as we started to reduce the, uh, the risk for ulceration for people with neuropathy, because we set up uh, good foot care, we set up foot clinics across the UK, the number of patients who developed neuropathic foot ulcers gradually went down. But then we had an aging population and people with peripheral arterial disease was very difficult to manage them, so the number of patients with ischemic ulcers gradually increased. We then also looked at the variation in care from center to center, again going back to the Eurodial study. And what we found is that in the Eurodial study, where we, we took 15 beacon centers from, uh, from Europe, we found that there was such a lot of difference, even though these centers were following the European Diabetes Foot Guidelines. What we found is that patients were being referred quite late to the foot clinic, and sometimes patients were referred three months after they had developed a foot ulcer. And we know that late referral leads to larger ulcers, but also higher amputation rates. We also found that late referrals led to reduced investigations and management for people with peripheral arterial disease. So in late referrals, about half the patients had not undergone previous vascular workup. Um, patients with ABI of less than 0.5, uh, they did not have uh, angiography in up to 50% of patients. So despite these centers having what we would class as being very good multidisciplinary foot team, multidisciplinary foot clinics, there was a huge variation in the care being delivered across centers. We know that total contact casting is the gold standard for neur neuropathic foot ulcers, but the use of total contact casting, we have pu published guidelines, we have done the research, but still you can see the use of total contact cast is only about 13% for patients who have got neuropathic foot ulcers. But the large variation between centers is from 0% to 70%. And it was difficult to tease out why there was this huge difference, maybe because of lack of staff to provide the, uh, the, the total contact cast, which is a specialist provision, but it may be because they were seeing more older patients and patients were not amenable because of risk of falls, etc. What about amputations? So there were not that many major amputations in the study, but we, therefore we looked at minor amputations. And again, you can see the difference in minor amputations from two per, um, two per hundred to as high as 30 per hundred. So again, this huge difference in the delivery of care needs to be investigated and actually looked into. So we have looked at variations in care. We have looked at how the care is being uh, provided, uh, both in Europe, uh, but also in the US. And, and how can we improve on that? I think what we always think is that I have done something for a, for a long period of time, and I think that is the best care I can give. But what we need to understand is that experience can just mean making the same mistake with increasing confidence. And if you do what you always did, you will get what you always got. So what we need is a paradigm shift in how we deliver foot care. So we can reduce this variation across centers and across countries and hopefully reduce amputations. So what do we need? We need good guidelines. We have the guidelines. So what do guidelines give us? They provide recommendations for the treatment and care for people with, uh, and also healthcare professionals. It is used to develop standards to assess the clinical practice of individual health professionals. It can be used in the education and training of health professionals. It can help patients to make informed decisions. And this is what I like about the latest ADA guidelines. It has now included a patient perspective also into the ADA guidelines and it can improve communication between patients and health professionals. 
But what's important is, although we have guidelines, it can assist the practice of healthcare professionals, they do not replace the knowledge and skills. When we looked at the, uh, the training of medical students uh, in the UK, and also the residents uh, in the UK, we found that very few of them were actually being exposed to diabetic foot clinics and, and being trained on how to manage diabetic foot. When I trained um, a few years ago now, I had to only attend 10 foot clinics, and I was signed off as being an expert in managing diabetic foot. But luckily, I worked with one of the best persons in the world, Andrew Bolton, so I had a lot of exposure to diabetic foot. So the things have changed, though, recently. When people come to my uh, and, and, and train under me, they spend one year with me, they do at least 50 to 100 foot clinics in that particular year. So the training has changed, but what we need to do is improve the training to healthcare professionals so they give the patients the best care possible. We also need to train non diabetic specialists. I noticed that when patients come to my hospital and they go to A&E, they're seen by the A&E consultant, but because we've got such a shortage of beds, it's a, it's, it's a drive to push patients home, to discharge them as soon as possible. And then these patients go home and they don't come back to the foot clinic. They don't get seen by a foot care specialist. It's another two, three weeks before they're seen in the, in the, by, the, by the foot team. So we are now doing training also in the, in the, in the a &E department, but also across the trust, so care can be standardized um, across the hospital. So there are so many diabetic foot guidelines. You've got the International Wound Society, you've got the ADA guidelines, the International Working Group on the Diabetic Foot. Um, this is the NICE guidelines, and we wrote the IDF guidelines a few years ago. We called it the Clinical Practice Guidelines. Um, and then we have the putting feet first guidelines. This is something that we, we did in, in, in the UK by Diabetes UK. And this is the guidelines we, we put for patients who come into hospital with a foot ulcer. Very often patients come to hospital with a foot ulcer and they languish in one corner of the hospital. They don't get seen by the specialist or by the podiatrist. And, and the patient is sent home without having any diabetic foot uh, input. So with these guidelines, we we, we put forward that when the patient comes to hospital, what should be done in the first four hours, what should be done in the next four to 48 hours and beyond 48 hours. And what we say is in the first 48 hours, what treatment should be given. And then within 24 hours, these patients should be referred to the diabetic foot team. And then either myself or my podiatrist will go and we'll see the patient anywhere in the hospital and if possible, take over the care and bring the patient to my ward. If the patient can't come to my ward because we have got shortage of beds, then we follow up the patient on the parent ward. And then when the patient is discharged from the hospital, we make sure that this patient has a follow-up within the foot clinic within three to seven days. So these guidelines now are being run across the UK and hoping that with this we will see a reduction in amputations. So what about the International Working Group on the Diabetic Foot? So the guidelines here have got five main uh, impacts. One is Prevention of foot ulcers in at-risk patients with diabetes. Footwear and offloading to prevent and heal foot ulcers. Diagnosis, prognosis, and management of PAD. Because it's so important that PAD is managed appropriately. Because these are the patients who will go on to have an amputation. Diagnosis and management of infections. Again, this is managed quite badly across the globe. And we need to, therefore, increase um, the... the the, the, the training for people looking after diabetic foot. And lastly, intervention to enhance the healing of chronic ulcers in people with diabetes. So they've got five very good uh, recommendations on how to treat people with diabetic foot problems. So what are the cornerstones for prevention? One, of course, important thing is to identify a person who's at risk for developing a foot problem, a regular inspection, and examination of the at-risk foot but also education of the patient and the family. Because quite often, the patients don't come to us in a timely fashion. You know, they get an ulcer, they put a Band-Aid, or they put a plaster on the wound, thinking that, uh, that the wound will heal, and then the patient comes to us with, with rip-roaring cellulitis or even osteomyelitis. So we are running training programs also in the community for our patients. Routine wearing of appropriate footwear and treating risk factors for ulceration. But also the important cornerstone which we should not forget about is glycemic management, control of blood pressure, and control of hyperlipidemia. 
because this will then reduce the progression of peripheral arterial disease, but also cardiovascular disease. And ultimately, using antiplatelet therapy. Most of our patients will have clinical, if not subclinical, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So we should be using antiplatelet therapies, and if necessary, also using anticoagulation. We have got good evidence that using DOAX will reduce amputations, but also mortality in people with foot ulceration. Of course, risk classification is also important, and there are various risk classifications. This is taken from the International Working Group. Uh, we got the ADA risk classification, we got the IDF risk classification. It's important to risk classify patients because it will then help us decide on how frequently on how frequently the patients need to be seen in the clinic, depending whether they've got risk category zero, which is very low, to risk category three, which is very high for risk for, for recurrence of ulceration or even amputation. So what are the benefits and the outcomes? What we will see probably is a reduction in ulceration and reulceration, a reduction in amputations, and also a reduction in mortality. But what are the risk factors for risk uh, for foot ulcer recurrence? And this is a paper from David Armstrong published uh, five years ago. And they looked at various uh, studies that have been done looking at the risk factors for ulceration and re-ulceration. And I've just circled the top eight here. And the most common one you can see here is a VPT of more than 25. And this is because we have got treatment options to treat somebody who's got a foot ulcer, those who've got a pre-ulcerative lesion, we can, we can, we can uh, remove the callus, we can give them footwear. If they've got PAD, we can revascularize the limb, but we still don't have treatments for neuropathy. And that is why somebody who's got severe neuropathy, you can see the, 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 um, the risk for re-ulceration is probably the highest. They then looked at interventions to reduce foot ulcer recurrence. And they looked at five interventions. One was patients to be seen in an integrated foot care setup, self-management by the patient, patient education, therapeutic footwear, and foot surgery. And what they showed is that by implementing these five uh, interventions will reduce ulceration by 30 to 60%. But you can see that patients who were given education, you would think that there was actually a negative effect. So what they then went on to look at was, is the effect of adherence to treatment. We know that many of our patients, you tell them to go to the gym, to change their lifestyle. How many patients follow it? Not that many. If you tell patients to wear their therapeutic footwear, do they wear it? No, they don't. I've got a, I've got a, a doctor colleague who developed a foot ulcer when we gave him footwear, and he would come to hospital with normal shoes, not with the footwear we advised him. So if patients are adherent to the treatment we offer them, then we can see a much bigger impact. You can see now as high as 80% prevention of recurrence of foot ulceration. So can foot ulcers actually be prevented? So this is a study from Spain. This is a single center study. It was a retrospective cohort taken from 2008 to 2014. But they divided the study into two. 20, uh, 2008 to 2011, and 2011 to 2014. Because in 2011, they set up a comprehensive foot care prevention program. Although the foot clinic started in 2008, in 2011, they set up this comprehensive foot care program, which was regular chiropody, foot care, counseling, including uh, giving people the correct footwear, education at each visit, preventive surgery if necessary, and metabolic control and control of comorbidities. And what they found is that there was a 45% recurrence of ulceration over that period of time. But the recurrence occurred much higher in patients who had severe neuropathy, as I showed in the previous study, and people who had previous minor amputee. And we can discuss why this led on to uh, uh, um, increased risk for ulceration. But what is important is that when they set up the comprehensive foot care program, you can see there was a 40% reduction in ulcer recurrence. So setting up a good foot care service will lead to reduction in ulceration, but also amputations. So we've always been talking about ulcer recurrence, but can we actually prevent the first ulcer? We need to understand that 
the first ulcer prevalence, incidence, sorry, is 7.5%. If you compare that to the incidence of ulcer recurrence, it's from 30 to 60%. And because of this, there are very few studies that have been done looking at first ulcer prevention. Because if you got a lower incidence, you will require a much larger study to give the effect that you want to see. So in the, in, in, in the um, International Working Group guidelines, when they looked at um, ulcer prevention, there were only three studies that were done looking at first ulcer, and 27 were looking at ulcer recurrence. And therefore, interventions in prevention of the first foot ulcer is of low quality because of the dominance of studies done looking at ulcer prevention if somebody has had a previous foot ulcer. But there are benefits that we can offer to patients. You can look at foot temperature monitoring, giving people therapeutic footwear, if they got neuropathy, if they got callus, and also a patient education. But there's a reluctance on the patient's part to accept, because these are tedious things to follow, and patients do not always adhere to the advice to give them. What about the cost effectiveness? We know from trials done from cardiovascular prevention trials, primary prevention trials, you need much larger cohorts than you would require in secondary prevention trials. What about amputations? So looking now at within country uh, amputations and prevention, this is a study from Germany. Again, you can see the study was done in 2007 to 2013. All patients who went into the, into the foot clinic received structured foot care. They then looked at major and minor amputations. And what they showed that there was a reduction by 17% in amputations when they set up the comprehensive foot care clinics. But the amputation reduction was mainly in major amputations. There was a slight reduction in minor amputations, but that was not significant. When we looked at data from the UK, this is from the northeast of the UK, again you can see over the five year period there was reduction in amputations, mainly major amputations. And the study from Ipswich, again, you can see reduction in major amputations with no change in minor amputations. Then we look at data from the US, and this is quite recent data. And this is a large cohort of around 7 to 8 million patients who came into hospital. This is taken from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. And they looked at the data from 2000 to 2015. And in 2000, 69% of all the patients in the US in this study who had a non-traumatic lower extreme amputation accounted for 69% of these patients had diabetes. In 2015, that increased to 75%. So this year shows the year-on-year -year, um, amputations for people with diabetes on the top and those without diabetes here at the bottom. And this is the cutoff they looked at at 2008. So what they showed is that from 2000 to 2008, there was a 43% reduction in amputations in the US. But when they looked at data from 2008 to 2015, it went up by 50%. When they looked at people without diabetes, there was a year-on-year -year reduction by 22% over that same period of time. They then looked at specifics down to the amputation, and they showed that it was mainly the minor amputation that increased, and this went up by 62%, with a slight increase in also major amputations by 29%. And they argued why this happened, and they think that in 2008, there was the downturn, the economic downturn, so maybe people were not accessing healthcare, or they were not able to get to the treatment centers because of the downturn. What about Germany? Again, they showed similar increase in amputations um, across Germany. Um, although there was a slight reduction in amputations when they standardized for age and sex. But again, they showed an increase in minor amputations with a reduction in major amputations. So in 2013-2014, Diabetes UK came up with this statement. There were 26,000 lower amputations in the previous three years. But when they looked at the three years before that, the increase was about 20% in the subsequent three years. And this is something that we were discussing uh, when we had the data that came on how we can make changes to try and reduce amputations across in people with diabetes. So this increasing amputation, is it real or is it artificial? 
most of the data I showed you has shown actually an increase in minor amputations. Is there therefore a shift but also setting up appropriate healthcare practices and proper comprehensive foot care programs. And like I said, it may be that the downturn, the economic downturn, may, be, may have led to the increased amputations that we saw in the US. So what we therefore need are good guidelines. But we have the guidelines, but we feel that it is not being adhered to. So what we need probably is a checklist for these guidelines, how to get things right. And in the UK, we've got now a program called GERFT, or Getting It Right the First Time. So in the UK, every year, every hospital, every practice is audited. And we look at the amputation rates. We look at foot ulcerations. But this is done across the board. It's done for cancer. It's done for cardiovascular disease, et cetera, et cetera. But from today's talk, we're looking at getting it right first time to prevent foot ulceration and amputation. And I would definitely recommend you to read this book if you haven't read it. It's called The Checklist Manifesto by Atul Gawande. And in this book, he talks about how guidelines have changed clinical practice. And you may or may not have read the book, but the first guideline I think that we know about is in the Second World War. And I don't know if, if, if you've read the book, but a lot of planes, when they were taking off in the Second World War, they were crashing. And the, the pilots had to just turn on a switch so the plane would not crash. And because of the heat of the moment, there were bombers flying overhead or whatever, they were forgetting to turn the switch on and the planes were crashing. So they had a guideline set in place that when the pilot takes off on the display panel, there'll be a notice that's saying switch on this particular switch. And from there on, we know now there have been guidelines across the board on how to manage not only people with diabetes, but also other uh, cardiovascular and other problems. So guidelines will help in quality improvement. It will help in clinical engagement, but also give better outcomes for patients. And this is taken from the International Working Group um, guidelines. When patients come to the foot clinic, everything that needs to be done in the foot clinic. And this is something that we devised uh, for our trust on how we should be managing people with diabetes, but also down at the bottom there are people who may develop a foot problem. But also we need guidelines for patients. And we've got the do's and the don'ts uh, to, to give to patients so they know what they should be doing to prevent a foot ulcer and what they should not be doing so they don't get a foot ulcer. Because we know that educating patients will give better foot care. And Inspecting the feet daily has been shown to improve uh, and prevent ulceration. Putting the shoes on correctly um, also will help, mainly by putting the hand in the shoe, looking for any foreign bodies, foreign objects in the shoe, and other things. All these have been shown to, to reduce ulceration and for people to adhere to the guidelines. But what are the physician attitudes to guidelines? This study from Australia showed that 70% of healthcare professionals felt that it had an impact on the quality of care. 71% thought it was a good educational tool, but 30% of people actually had concerns. And 23% thought that the guidelines were impractical. And the other concerns that they had, that the protocols will not be feasible in every patient, and it could lead to malpractice and litigation. So this may be some of the reasons why uh, healthcare professionals do not follow the guidelines. So to come to the question, how to win the war in people with diabetic foot problems? And I'd like to go back to the, the World Cup, when, uh, when India won the World Cup. We have to have a good team for the first place. We have to have a good captain. We have to have a good relationship between the team members of the diabetic foot team. And of course, share when we have good stories and not so good stories. But what we need in the end is a good lead. And there has to be a lead in the foot clinic who will lead the team to give best foot care. 
to do the audits, to make sure the guidelines are being followed, and to bring the team together. And then we can take home the cup by reducing amputations and ulcerations. So to conclude, are we winning the war on complications? I don't think so. I showed data from various countries, the increasing number of amputations that we're seeing despite having all the guidelines. What we need is a paradigm shift to protect patients who are in risk category zero, those who don't have neuropathy, don't have PAD, to prevent them from progression to risk category one, loss of protective sensation, and then risk category three, leading on to amputations. We should be working together in teams, educating not only healthcare professionals, but also patients. Or I should say, educating not only patients, but also healthcare professionals. And we should be working with the guidelines. And with that, hopefully, we can win the war against foot complications and also amputations. Thank you.